Hello, welcome to RH at Home. I'm Chad, pastor here at Redemption Hill Church. Over the last few days, few really, I guess, weeks, I've been trying to spend some time with the Lord, um, praying and, and seeking Him on, on how we as a church, and maybe me more specifically as a pastor, should respond in times like these. You see, over really the last two, two and a half months, we've been bombarded with a lot of different issues, a lot of different things. And honestly, they've all been legitimate. Some of these things aren't new. Some of these have been around for, for times, even going back to the Old Testament. They've been around forever. As we have tried to navigate this season as a church, but again, just as pastor, I think it's imperative that this, God's Word is our guide. This is what we go to to find direction, and this is what we cling to as we navigate the journey of life, as we strive to find the course that the Lord wants us on. One of the things that's become increasingly clear to me is a necessity for us to focus in on a topic. Now this goes kind of against like our method when it comes to our teaching style. Typically speaking, we go verse by verse through books of the Bible. Um, we've done that since the beginning, since, since we began Redemption Hill Church. It's kind of been one of our core, not values, but core things that we've done. I still believe in that. I, I believe that God's Word has to be central. I believe that we, we keep this um, in the forefront. I believe that as we go through things verse by verse through Scripture, then we'll, then we'll have, if we're going to be faithful to that style of teaching, then we will have to address certain topics. It won't give us the liberty of, of running and hiding. So um, we will continue to that. But I, I, after, after much prayer and much consideration, we're going to spend the next probably three to four weeks talking about the topic of love. A few weeks ago, while we were still in the midst of our um, quarantine, you know, the, the distancing, it was before we had our, we were able to go back to life person messages and, and services. Um, I, I preached a message out of the book of Mark, chapter 12, called Love God, Love Others. And I, I, I want us to begin with, with that same passage because I think it's, it's, it's very critical for, and really the foundation for what we hope to talk about over the next few weeks. In Mark, chapter 12, Starting in, in verse 28, it says this, And one of the scribes came and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him. So the scribe here has heard Jesus um, kind of going back and forth with all these other Pharisees. And he's been watching and listening. And honestly, he's been impressed by Jesus. And so, so he says to him, he goes, Well, which is the command? Which... Which commandment is the most important of all? It's a big question. When, when you have some 613 commandments, you want to narrow it down to one. Like That's a big ask. And Jesus answered, the most important is, and really before he gets to, or, or he says this, he goes, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. So even really before he gets to answering the question or, you know, with which is the most important commandment, he begins by reminding the people there's one God. There's one God. And listen, like for us, many of us, I'm, I'm guessing most who are watching this, like even you might not even consider yourself really a Christian, maybe a quasi-Christian. But you would say you wouldn't necessarily object with the idea that there's a God. Now we might, you might think and you might call it that God different names. But Jesus here says, as he's 
about to address that, he reminds them, there's one God. And listen, as we've gone through the several weeks of the coronavirus, as we've seen the economy go up and down, as we've begun to to, um, witness the last couple weeks of of all this racial tension, I, I I think it's important for us to be reminded there's one, there's only one God. We we tend to place other things on shelves that if we're not careful, we begin to worship them as if they were a God. It might be a position at work. It might be um, a certain income. It might be that dream house or a vehicle that you drive. There's a lot of different things. And again, if we're not careful, we can elevate good things. Family, like spouse, children. If we're not careful, we can, we can begin to, uh, to put them in a position in which they've been elevated to a God. And so while we might say that we believe in God, we have to be very careful when, when Jesus is reminding us there's one God, that we don't have God, and then next to God, a shelf with a lot of other littler things that we might, can, if we're not careful, allow to become like God's. But he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. In essence, what what Jesus is saying to that scribe who's inquisitive about what's the most important command? By acknowledging first there's a God, he goes, now that one God, well, he should be your everything you see you need to love him with all that you have not with just a portion of your life you can't segment make a a, a section of time you can't give him just a, a portion of your financial resources you can't allow him time um in certain companies of people but restrict him when you're in other audiences He can't just have your mind in the morning when you wake up or when you say a quick prayer before a meal or maybe when you're laying your head on a pillow at night and and as you begin to drift off to sleep, say a few words in the form of a prayer. No, no, you see, what what Jesus answers him is is like, if you really want to know, it's this, that you love the Lord with everything, everything. That he, that he becomes the most important thing in your life. And then Jesus says, and the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, these are right, teacher, or you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one. And there is no other besides him. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as oneself is much more than a whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And then Jesus saw that answer and he wisely said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him questions. And I find it interesting. And, and as Jesus turns and after, he's, after he makes that The very clarifying statement of loving God with everything, that He has all of our heart, that He has all of our mind, He has all of our soul, our spirit, our strength. And then He says, and just like that, we're to love others, love your neighbor. That scribe who is watching and listening to Jesus, well, He he answers him or responds back to that and says that he was right that there only is one Lord. And he was right that, that if, if you love the Lord with, all your th- with everything and then you love others, but, but notice what he says there. He says the value of that, well, it's greater than, than all the other burnt offerings and sacrifices. And that scribe was a religious person, just like I'm probably talking to people that are watching this who are at least somewhat religious. That you might believe in God. You might come to church. Some of you that are watching this are probably very faithful to church. And the only reason you're watching this, not here in person, is because of the coronavirus. 
Maybe there are others who, who just happen to stumble upon this video. I mean, you see it, you, you realize it's about the Bible, and so you know the Bible, and so you're inquisitive. Listen, what he says, one of the things that blows my mind in the midst of this, especially to those of us who are from a, 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 a religious background, a religious leaning, he says not only are those the greatest two commandments, but he, in essence, that what that scribe responds back with is loving God and loving others, well, that's, that's more important, that's greater than all of your other religious practices. All those other things that you think make you religious or make you look religious or make you feel good about yourself. Like, understand, like, all of those things, I mean, they pale in comparison to those two commandments, to love God and to love others. I feel it's imperative that for the next few weeks, we wrestle with this idea of love. 1 John chapter 4, really, there, I want us to, we're going to highlight two parts of, of this chapter. First, it, it reveals to us where the source of love is. Um, it, it starts with verse 7. So, so 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves, whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Listen, in, in that, those two sentences or those two verses, we're, we're, the source of love is identified. See, the source of love is God. He is love, and it comes from Him. As we're going to see this, I believe why I think it's so critical for us to say that we have to look at those two commandments. Right now, there's a great leaning, a great leading, a great pushing for us to love others, to love people in our, in, in our communities, people in our world. And we've seen a great outcry deservedly so for racial inequality, social justice. All those things are, are, are true and real. But listen, I, I, what I want us to do, what I feel um, it, that I, it's imperative for me as, as a pastor to, to begin to express to our people, to, to try to drill into our people, is that it has to begin first with loving God. See, I believe this. When Jesus gives the commandments one and two, like we can't accomplish two until we get one. We can't accomplish loving others until we have come to a point where we've grown in a point in which we love God, that God has everything in us. And that everything that we desire is in and through Him. He begins to control our thoughts, our minds, our hearts, our actions. You see, until we get to that point, you know, we can't truly love others. We're incapable of truly loving others aside from loving God first. Hey, um, we've addressed where the source of love is. And this is why I say we can't, we can't fully love others until we love God truly. Hold, hold your finger there in 1 John, because we're coming back in a second. Because in a second, we're going to look at that 1 John gives us kind of a definition of love. But I want you to flip back a, a, a little bit in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Starting in um, verse 2, it says this. It says, for, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, Proud and arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, and Paul warns Timothy to avoid such people. Listen, I, I, 
If you're like me, as I read that list of what Paul describes as society, as, as people to be in the lookout for, below, above that, the verse 1 says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Paul was looking into the future. What Paul saw as the future, I would tell you is present for us. I mean, does that list not sound like the world in which we live? Lovers of self? I mean, not selfless, but selfish. How many of these issues and problems and struggles is do we see because of this inner desire of our own selfish needs? Lovers of money, proud and arrogant, abusive. And we've seen that. I would say that has taken center stage in the last two, three weeks. Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless. I don't know how anyone could watch what's been going on, what's been transpiring really for the last, I don't even know how long now, without there being a tug of pulling at your heart. Without self-control, brutal. Not loving good. Treacherous. Reckless. Swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. See, to me, as I, as I think through that list, man, why it's so important for us when it, for us to first have God in our lives, to, to love Him. Like that, that love for Him, when our eyes are focused in on Him and we draw closer to Him, then we begin to pull away from that long list of things that Paul described. You see, why I say we do need to love others, absolutely, yes, we do. But if we don't love God first, there's going to be a God in our life, and more than likely, that God is going to be yourself. And because it's going to be yourself, then all those other things are going to come to fruition. We're going to see the roots of all those other things. That's why society today, when it's absent God, is a mess. It has to begin with the source of love. If we want love, if we want our world to experience long-lasting love, not band-aids, we don't need any more band-aids. If we want love, then God must come first in our life. We ought to be on our knees praying, asking the Lord to draw us individually closer to Him. We ought to be begging God that in the midst of all of this that is going on in our world today, that revival breaks out, that people come to know the Lord, that hearts are transformed. The only quick fix in all of this mess is Jesus entering the hearts and lives of people. That is the only thing that can fix all of this. So, when we get back to 1 John chapter 4, after we see the source of love, well then, the next few verses kind of gives us a definition of love. And again, if, if, if God is the source, then we can see the definition through the source. I love it. It, it says this, and, and really five things are presented here in a really quick fashion. Verse 9 says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. Your translation may, instead of saying manifest, may say shown. That word manifest, it's kind of a fancy word, but that idea of, of, of manifest, it's, it's to be made visible, to, to, to be made known, to, to show. See, that idea, like that first part of love, like we have to understand is this, is that, that love is shown, love is visible, love is, is known. Like we can't, 
if love is within us, if true love abides in us, we can't hide it. We can't keep it inside. The second it goes on to this, it says that not only is it visible, but um, so it says that God has made manifest among us that God sent. So maybe if you have your Bibles and you're with this along the way, maybe the first thing you do is you you circle that word manifest. I understand, like that's the first thing. It's shown, like love, like if we're looking at a definition of love, it's visible, it's shown, it's seen, it's manifest. And the second thing that we need to see, and, and again, maybe you, you, you circle God sent, we see that love is, it's a decision. Um, love, we can also say like it's an act of the will. Love is not just standing idle. Love is not um, in not engaging. See, love requires a decision. But when we think in earthly terms of love, we often think of that warm, gushy feeling, that fuzzy feeling. Or we, we think of those the way love might be portrayed in these movies. You know, even the young kids with the stories like Sleeping Beauty and things like that. So we, we, we turn love into an emotion. You see, love is not an emotion. But a byproduct of love might be part of an emotion, but it's not the emotion entirely. Mo- emotions come and go. Love is a decision. But for those of us who are married... But there was a decision that you faced, a decision that you decided that that one who is your spouse now was going to be your one and only. That you loved, like, like you were deciding to be, maybe become exclusive with that person. And so you, maybe you got in a church or you, you went in some location, whatever, you had a wedding ceremony, right? And you stood in front of a minister or a pastor or somebody and, and your family and your friends and publicly there you made a decision there you you visibly show them a deciding like you were going to love that person good bad or indifferent right for richer for poorer and sickness and in health so if it was based upon rich man when, when we cope through those difficult times and, and we would just throw love away. If it was based on health, when, when health wasn't there, we would just toss it away. But, but see, the love was intended to be a decision, an act of the will. Courtney will tell me oftentimes, which I deserve, right, that, that she loves me, but she doesn't like me, <laughs> right? I mean, those of us who've been married long enough, like, w- there are moments when there are arguments, disagreements, Right? We don't necessarily like our spouse in that moment, but we still choose to love our spouse. See, and that's what love is. See, God made a decision. He sent His Son. Right? And so it says that, that, that um, He made, that, that God, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His Son. And then, that's the third thing. I want, you, I want you to circle that idea of only Son. Because you know what else is we define as we look at what love really is. We, we see that love has a price. Love, love is a sacrifice. It's not about what we get, but it's about what we're willing to give. And listen, if it's going to be a sacrifice, it's going to come at a great cost. For God... He sent His only Son. He sent Jesus, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Guys, if we're talking real godly love, it's going to require a sacrifice. It's going to come with a cost. It won't be cheap. God didn't offer us leftovers. He sent us the best, the greatest, the greatest thing he could offer, he sent for us. As we consider this idea of love right now, as we consider this idea that we're supposed to love others, 
that love for others should be visible, should be shown, it should be known. That love for others, well, I mean, you have to decide that. You have to decide, consciously decide, I'm going to, I'm going to love others. And that love for others will come, or should come, real godly love will come at a sacrifice. It won't be easy. It may cost you financially. It will certainly cost you with your time. It's going to cost you maybe not being able to go to the golf course or go out fishing like like you'd like to do. It, It may not allow you to binge watch Netflix. It may not allow you to just hang out at Starbucks. It's going to come at a cost, a price. So right now, while, while it seems to be easy for everyone to jump on and, 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 and want to love others, are you willing to pay a price for that love? Are you willing to sacrifice for love? Notice what it says here. It says, So in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His only Son, and check this, this fourth one out, into the world so that we might live through Him. Again, I circle world so that we. Listen, love, for us to to show and demonstrate godly love. That doesn't mean we only love the people that we like. It doesn't mean that we only love the people who understand us, who get us. It doesn't mean that we only love the people who prescribe to the same political party that we do. That we have the same skin color that we do that enjoy the same hobbies that we do, that have the same financial resources that we do. You see, what in that definition that John's giving us as he's showing us what godly love from the source, like what true love is, he shows us that we're willing to love those who aren't going to love us. What do you, how do you, how do you get that part? Chad? Like, how do you get that from here? You might be thinking. Because it says right here that came into the world so that we, you know what Romans 5 8 says? It says that God demonstrated his love for us. So, the way he showed his love for us. Now, while we were still sinners, Christ died. For us. Listen, he died for us while we were still sinners. He didn't wait for the light to go on in all of our minds for all of us to understand. He didn't wait for us to come and apologize. He didn't wait for us to clean up our act. He died for us while we were still sinners, while we were still rejecting him. Y'all, we've not too far past the Easter story. Jesus, sometimes we think that Jesus, when he died on the cross, it was for those disciples. It was for those who were there around him, his mom, who were you know, mourning him. He did die for them. But you know who else he died for? That soldier who was holding that, that cat of nine tails that struck the back of Jesus, that tore the flesh off his back. You know who else he died for? That those who slapped him in the face, those who spit upon him, the crowds that were, that were chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He died for them as much as he died for you and I. He died for those who would reject him. He loved them. And so we don't have the right to pick and choose who we love. If we want to demonstrate good, godly love, It's going to be to those who aren't like us, who don't look like us, who don't act like us, who don't believe like us. And I think it's critical because 
as we continue. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. See, what I hope we see in the midst of this is, is that love, God's love, ultimately pays a price for sin. It addresses sin in our lives and in all lives. See, when we get the, this definition of love, and I hope that we begin to see the importance of love, and we can begin to see the impact that love can have. That when we see and we, we understand that we first and foremost have to love God with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our mind, all of our strength. In order for us to begin to even love, love others, we have to love Him most. And when we look to that source, being God is love. When we look to that source, and we see the way in which He loved us, and if we're going to embody Him, if we're going to be His image bearers, if you will, but then we have to understand that, that our love needs to be visible. That our love was a decision that we're going to make. An act of our own will. That our love is going to be sacrificial. It's going to come with a price that we're going to be willing to pay. And that price, we're not picking and choosing. We're going to love those, even those, who may reject us, who may laugh at us, who may hate us, who may spit at us, but we're still going to love them. Why? One, because God's commanded us. God's shown us, but, but ultimately, y'all, get to this. Earlier I said the only way, the only way these problems can be switched instantly is through Jesus. It's through relationship with God. He is the only one who can transform hearts. And listen, as we demonstrate love, as we show it, right, as, as, we, as we do all those things that we've talked about, ultimately, that love, His love, addresses sin. And I'll end with this little bit. Verse 11 says this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's the same example. The example in which Jesus, God, showed us what love was. Well, then we're, if we're genuinely believers, if we really claim to be believers in Christ, then it's imperative that we do what He did for us. It says, No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. See, that's what I'm, again, we can't love others until we love God. By His Spirit, we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. So, over the next few weeks, as we focus in on what love is, my hope today is that we see the source of love. And again, folks, as we contemplate this, I'm not looking for band-aids. I want, I want us to experience change, lasting, long-lasting, eternal change. We see the source of love, that God is that source. And then we look at the way in which He defined love. We saw in 1 John 4, 9 and 10, love is visible, shown, it's known, like we see it. It's something that can be seen. The decision that we make, that we decide that we are going to love, we, and then we act upon it. That it comes with a cost, with a price, that it's a sacrifice. We do it to all. We love all, even the ones who don't love us or like us. With the hope of that love that's been demonstrated from God through us draws those people to the Lord. And so we see souls saved and lives changed. 
for God's glory and our good. I love you guys. And after talking about love, I want you to know that I, I really do love you. I'm praying for you. That we're here for you. If you're watching this, this message now, I don't know where it could, it could be 10 years down the road. If you're watching this, and you have the ability, maybe you made a decision about something, or maybe you have questions about something, I would be thrilled if you would just send me an email. It should be there at the bottom of your screen. Just send me an email. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for our country. Join me in praying for our country. That yes, we see social justice. And yes, we see all these things that, that are being presented. But we also see revival, life change, transformation. Can't wait to see you.